Hello, everyone. This is Gabriel. Welcome to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I'm so glad that you have tuned in to this channel. This is a really uh, special episode with a leading Muslim thinker, Mustafa Akyol, who has written a number of books recently on questions of Islam and freedom and liberty. Uh, and um, I think the discussion uh, touches on questions that will be of really broad appeal. Um, some of them specifically about his engagement with the Quran in defense of um, an argument for liberty from an Islamic perspective, but others that um, range more uh, uh, broadly to questions of religion and freedom, institutions, and some, uh, some of his own personal story from Turkey to the United States. So thank you so much for joining. Um, friends, please take a moment to subscribe to this channel. Um, and also like this specific video. I'd be really grateful for that. Um, this will help uh, me uh, find some inspiration to keep on providing this kind of content. Thank you and enjoy the episode. Hello, Mustafa Akil. Good to be with you. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Gabriel Said Reynolds. Good to be with you as well. It's a pleasure to have this conversation together. Thank you. The pleasure is mine, and um, I'm really looking forward to this um, this episode uh, of exploring the Quran and the Bible. Um, I'm a big fan of yours, and uh, a great believer that um, you know your work raises really important questions for Muslims and non-Muslims, um, but also engages with the Quran in a really interesting way. So it's, it's totally apt for this uh, this YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And, and I'm a fan of your work as well. So we keep learning from each other. Uh, thank yeah. you. It's a pleasure. Great. Yes. Okay. So I have a sort of formal uh, bio that I'll read to start off. And then, you know, we'll have a free ranging conversation about your work. Um, friends, everyone who's watching uh, this conversation will focus mostly on Mustafa's recent work, um, especially his recent two books. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to convince him to come back because his earlier work, especially on the Jesus of Islam, is really, really important. Um, but let me go ahead and start with this with this bio. So everyone, Mustafa Akil is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, where he focuses on the intersection of public policy, Islam and modernity. He has a frequent or rather he is a frequent opinion writer for the New York Times covering politics and religion in the Muslim world. He is the author of several books, including a, a really important book that made uh, waves in academia and the public sphere, Reopening Muslim Minds, A Return to Reason, Freedom and Tolerance. And that's this book right here. Uh, so strongly encouraged we'll be speaking about that today. And uh, that was published in 2021, I think with St. Martin's Press, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, and then published by the Cato Institute also in 2021 is this book, Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty. Uh, so uh, really brilliant, well-written um, book that is easily digestible. Um, it's really appropriate for a broad audience. And then before that, he wrote The Islamic Jesus, How the King of the Jews Became a Prophet of the Muslims. That's published in 2017, I think also by St. Martin's. And then in 2011, uh, he published Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty. I think that was with Norton. I don't have That's it written down. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And maybe went to a second edition too? Uh, they, it did paperback like uh, others. And, and there'll be a paperback edition of Reopening Muslim Minds in a few months too, inshallah. So, Great. Great. Uh, Wonderful. And his books have been translated into many languages, praised in a number of places, you know, really minor places like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so, you know, he's a major public intellectual. It's really an honor to have him um, have him with us. Uh, the Thinking Muslim, a popular podcast, recently defined Mustafa Akil as, quote, probably the most notable Muslim modernist and reformer, end quote. And in July 2021, the Prospect magazine of the United Kingdom, the UK listed him among the world's top 50 thinkers. So really, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you, Gabriel, again. And thanks for the you know, attention to the books. And uh, I hope people can be interested in it. If they are ever, uh, if people want to read it quickly, this book, Why I Defend as a Muslim, is, uh, Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty, is freely downloadable. Thanks to the Cato Institute at libertarianism.org. So they can even get a quick PDF and read it. Terrific. Terrific. Great. And it's a really great place to start, I think, 
um, connecting with your thought and your ideas, uh, and then you can move on to the other other books. Well, why don't we start with um, sort of a biographical note? We had sort of the highlights of your academic achievements, but could we go sort of a couple steps back? Could you tell us a little bit about your background and your life's journey from uh, Turkey to Washington, D.C.? Uh, sure. I mean, I'm from Turkey. I grew up first in Ankara, then in Istanbul, in English speak English language school. So I always had this exposure to the Western social sciences or let's say liberal worldview. Um, uh, in, in my high school years though, I um, joined, I mean, I think really in the second or third year, what I can broadly call Turkey's Quranic Ehlal Quran movement, as we call it at the time. That was a kind of a reformist understanding of Islam. Still, you know, it has different versions in Turkey and different communities or, or strains, which is a little bit skeptical about Hadith. That is the, of course, the big textual source of the two sources of the Sharia, uh, but more focusing on the Quran and taking Quran as the main guide in, in matters of Islam. Some of them totally reject Hadith, and I don't as pleased, maybe in the beginning I was like that, but I thought it was a naive and wrong understanding. We need, uh, of course, both the Quran and the Hadith, but the primacy of the Quran, if you will, has been a dominant uh, understanding. I mean, I began reading the Quran hundred, like dozens of times. I mean, in the last years of my high school and then college, and I was in, involved in Quranic studies and uh, and I wrote pamphlets about the miracles of the Quran. So it was a very Quran centric point of view, my, my own Islamic upbringing. Um, though I, over time, my this textualist sola scriptura, if you will, understanding of the Quran matured, in my view, hopefully, <laughs> uh, by reading also scholars like Fazlur Rahman, who had a very right big like, influence on me. He had a big influence on Turkey's theological landscape. Uh, I should say that. I mean, Fazlur Rahman Malik, of course, was a Pakistani scholar who couldn't survive in Pakistan, had to come to the US and teach here because he was targeted by some militant groups. And he offered this well, perspective that we call historicism, mm -hmm. that understanding the Quran in its history and its context, and therefore taking sometimes things less literally. Mm -hmm. Uh, that also entered into my thinking uh, in the, let's say, 2000s, and, and it had a big impact on Turkish theological landscape as well. So Tur Turkish theologians such as Ilhami Güler or Hayri Kırvaşoğlu or Mustafa Öztürk or Osman Özsoy, these are the names people may not know, but they are very influential, sometimes controversial in Turkey. And I learned a lot from their writings as well. And they published this magazine, Islamiyat, uh, and, and that, that brought these puzzle Rahmani perspectives that the conservatives didn't like that much. But a lot of interesting scholarship uh, was there. So I, I really devoured all that literature and wrote about these things in, in the public landscape because I became a columnist for a newspaper in early 2002. So I was trying to approach Islamic issues from a more reformist and sometimes liberal perspective. From right, liberal right, right. Classical yeah, I, I wanted to follow up a little bit more about sort of the social political context. So in the 90s, 2000s, um, yeah, what was it like being a religious Muslim in that context? Um, you know, did you have sort of a consciousness at the time that, you know, the dominant political powers were secularists? Uh, yeah. And was there a sense of sort of tension or rivalry in, in that way? There was. I mean, in the 90s, I should say, I strongly disliked the regime <laughs> in Turkey, mm -hmm. which was hyper secularist. Mm -hmm. And there were elected governments, but the military was imposing this very rigid French style secularism, even much more illiberal than, than that of France. Mm -hmm. We call it laiklik, actually. It came, it came from France to Turkey. Nice and one, the symbol was banning the headscarf in the in the public square, as they call it, which would include campuses and all public jobs. So you couldn't wear a headscarf and enter campus. And I was like so much against that whole secularist dictates on Turkey's conservative landscape. One thing I noticed though, was that Turkey's religious conservatives were obviously against this, but there were people called the liberals who also opposed this. And they were not religious themselves, most of them, but they were defending uh, the right to wear a headscarf as a part of the individual's right to define and decide upon his or her life, uh, lifestyle and, and human rights. And so I said, here's an interesting, you know, thing here coming together. And I like that. So, I mean, that actually helped 
me uh, get more focused into the liberal tradition, which I knew a little bit from my studies in, in college. So I tried to build this synthesis uh, of political liberalism and religious conservatism in Turkey, which worked well in the beginning when the conservatives came to power in the early 2000s and they needed the European Union accession process. So there was this interesting environment. But what happened is soon, the, the regime I strongly disliked was replaced by another regime, which I again strongly dislike today, which is conservative, not from a, uh, which is oppressive, not from a secularist point of view, but from a so-called Islamic or conservative point of view. So I, I find myself not really at home uh, in terms of my, my mindset and my uh, aspirations in both of these turkeys, which are, I think, both oppressive in different in different perspectives right. from opposite right. points of view but in, in in some sense very similar too mm. and um yeah i mean i i don't want to push you too much to go into all sorts of details but i can only imagine that um i mean it's it's traumatic feeling at at home yet not at home and of course you ended up in in washington at the cato institute yeah. could, could you fill in the gaps a little bit about how you ended up in in washington and how things are going there yeah i mean well, I, I joined the Cato Institute in 2018. Uh, I knew the Cato Institute over the years before that they had invited me kindly to some of their events. And I liked their emphasis on liberty and human rights in a, in a, in a broad sense, in, in, in a principled way. And ultimately, my work on Islam and liberty, you know, brought, I think, me to the attention of Cato. And I got this nice offer to join the Cato Institute and, and work on these issues here safely. And that was a blessing to be honest, because I was not feeling very safe in Turkey anymore. Okay. Uh, I was not sa safe in the sense that, first of all, I should say that in Turkey, I used to be a public figure. Like I had columns in a national newspaper and another column in an English language, Hurriyet Daily News, which was the, uh, the world, uh, the window to the world. I had a TV show where I would have guests and we would discuss politics and theology and, and philosophy and everything. All that abruptly ended <laughs> by 2015, okay. uh, 14, with a few calls from Ankara because the government had began uh, rehabilitating the media, which means they were actually transforming every media outlet into a government propaganda outlet. So uh, I was totally pushed aside. And I realized that there's not much to do in Turkey in an environment like this. And even uh, you wouldn't know, you know whether the police would knock on your door at some point okay so i don't want to get into too much details and and there are people who went through worse things than what i right. went through so i don't want to dramatize it as well but turkey didn't unfortunately look very promising at least for intellectual career for future and when i got an invitation to come to dc so i i happily That's accepted wonderful. that and right. you know I'm really grateful that that happened. Right. Well, I want to begin speaking about the Quran by addressing the question of religious freedom, which is related to this whole sort of um, personal journey that you had from Turkey to Washington and your current work. And um, you've written a lot about the, the, the famous phrase from Surat al-Baqarah, from Surah 2, La ikraha fiddin, um, there is no compulsion in religion. And you actually begin this book, Re Reopening Muslim Minds, by telling a story about something that happened in 2017, where um, I think you were in Boston um, at the time, or Wellesley, maybe is that right, Wellesley? Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, you you traveled to to Malaysia to give some talks for an organization there that's sort of friendly to reformist ideas and things. So, um, yeah, could you set that in context a little bit? Um, if you want to, you know, retell briefly that story, that would be great. But no, no obligation. Um, but it, we're I'd also be interested in hearing about you know what are the issues or like what is what is the dialogue even polemic around this phrase la ikraha fiddin yeah sure definitely uh, first of all um gabriel i should say that i mean there are sometimes verses or passages in our scriptures that it stays there for centuries but at some point in our history we see a deeper and bigger meaning in that mm. I think, if I'm wrong, correct me, but I think, uh, for example, the statement in the New Testament of Jesus Christ, render unto God what is God's and render unto Caesar what is Caesar. This is, for example, understood in the modern era as an inspiration for separation of church and state. It wasn't always understood that way. But when, I mean, when some Christians saw the need for separation of church and state, they said, oh, actually what Jesus is saying here is 
That's an example of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I know it was also used for divine rights of kings before. <laughs> I mean, people took it into different directions. Um, I think something like that is happening in Islam in the past century and a half with the birth of Islamic modernism, with Muhammad Abdul in Egypt and uh, young Ottomans or new Ottomans in, in, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Muslims realized the modern world is something different than what they used to be. They, they saw attention. And they went back, they wanted to go back to scripture and to find new inspirations, right? And some of that going back to scripture movements went to the totally negative <laughs> direction. I mean, so Salafis, I mean, these are the ones that went back to the scripture basically to beam ourselves back to seventh century and being a very literalist and rigid. But other perspectives of going back and discovering things gave us the direction we call Islamic modernism. And one of the highlights of this Islamic modernist movement has been the importance of freedom in Islam, in which we can find in some verses of the Quran, but those verses have not been cultivated in the tradition enough from, from our perspective today. Actually, some of those verses have been abrogated. I mean, they were ab considered as abrogated with the verses of war and I mean, the, 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 the verse of the sword and the verse of Qatar, that's war. And, and whereas those verses, in my view, were addressing a specific situation, so they took them as abrogated. Mm -hmm. uh, Bakara 256, that's the beginning of the verse, of course, as you know. Uh, that was not, some even considered it abrogated, but that was not necessarily considered as abrogated, but it was considered in a very limited sense. Mm -hmm. They said, yes, there's no compulsion in religion, which means Ahl al Kitab, which is Christians and Jews, will not be forced to. Uh, except Islam. Mm -hmm. And this was actually quite a generous uh, policy in, 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 in the pre-modern world, right? I mean, there was forced conversion forced happening conversion. quite mm -hmm. quite repeatedly in, in different parts of the world, including in, in Europe. Um, so Jews and Christians were not forced to convert. Later, luckily, this was expanded to Hindus and Buddhists as well. So there was, and they were not given equal rights, so that was not a modern heaven, but uh, for that time, it was interesting. But but there are other acts of compulsion in Islamic uh, legal tradition in, in, shari in the interpretations of Sharia, such as uh, apostates are given the death penalty. Uh, and also, oh, if you don't do certain religious practices like praying, you know, there will be hispa forces, that is religious police forces, mm -hmm. that will come and admonish you for this, punish you for this. So, uh, so there is this while the Quran says there's no compulsion on religion, there's a lot of compulsion going on. And so I'm among those people who say, well, let's take this, there is no compulsion on religion principle to the fullest meaning, which means let's not have any apostasy laws. Let's not have blasphemy laws too, which is connected. Mm -hmm. uh, it's another compulsion. Uh, and then let's not have religious policing as well. So let Muslims, communities, individuals practice their Muslimness in the way they deem fit without being uh, controlled by a government or a government employee group or sometimes vigilante groups that you know kind of trying to discipline them. Uh, this is of course a reformist argument. And uh, in Malaysia, I was invited in 2017 by Islamic Renaissance Front, which is a Muslim organization quite like-minded <laughs> from my point of view, which is they're also Islamic modernists. Right, right. And they are challenging some of the authoritarian interpretations or illiberal interpretations of uh, Islam in Malaysia, which is very dominant. And I gave this lecture saying that, you know, like Rafi Din, uh, let's take that seriously as the basis of principle and let's not have apostasy laws, basically, I said, as Muslims. And apostasy laws have no basis in the Quran. Its basis in the Hadith is debatable. Mm -hmm. And even, even if that was relevant at a certain context. We don't live in that context anymore. It was probably confused with political rebellion. Today, apostasy doesn't mean the same thing. If people conscientiously change their religion. As Muslims, we don't want to be, we wouldn't be happy to see that. But, you know, people become apostates from Christianity and accept Islam as well. And it's good that Christians are not punishing them for this. I mean, we would be outraged if they did. So I made these arguments in a public lecture in Kuala Lumpur. And at the end, I said, religion is not something that you can really enforced by threats. I mean, religion is not something that you can police. Uh, then the, 
Then serious people walked into the room and they said, uh, you said religion cannot be police. I said, yes, yeah, we are the religion police. <laughs> so, um, so that initiated a process where the next day I was arrested while, while at the airport while trying to leave the country. And uh, luckily I was arrested just for 18 hours. So that thanks to some diplomacy, they let me go. Um, but then they, they, they banned my book still in Malaysia. And I, as I highlight in my book, uh, they're taking an issue with La Ikra Hafiddin, there is no compulsion on religion. And that's why in, in translations, they put a few words into the words. So it reads, there is no compulsion in religion while entering Islam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they want to make sure that no compulsion mm -hmm. is limited to, to not enter. forcing but people But once, you're in, once you're in, but once once you're in, in it, it can be compulsion. Yeah, you are. And again, Malaysians are not giving death penalty for apostasy, which is the verdict in Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, I'm sure under the Taliban too now, uh, but they are doing things like sending them to rehabilitation centers. So there's some government process trying to correct them and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. which involve being jailed in a you know correctional mm -hmm. or like a rehabilitation center. And I think these are wrong. Right, so, right, yeah, right, right. Well, it's very powerful the example you give, um, and this comes up in your writing in a couple of places. Maybe we'll touch on those too, where you sort of invite the reader to a thought experiment about well, what if the situation were reversed? Um, so I, you know, you quote a prominent uh, Muslim intellectual about, um, about uh, you know, questions of blasphemy laws and how that could be connected to hate speech laws and could eventually be a weapon used against Muslims, say, mm -hmm. quoting, quoting the Quran. Um, so, yeah, I, I actually wanted to, to pursue this question of compulsion um, in religion and or compulsion to religion a little bit further, um, and I, I think in Why as a Muslim I Defend Liberty, in this book, you, you note the example, I, I can't remember the name of the, the Turkish religious leader who uh, wrote an article saying there is compulsion in religion, it's just not to religion. Uh -oh. Do you remember He's that? He was an imam. He was an imam. And it was, it was a sermon, because in Turkey, of course, this there is no compulsion in religion, ayah, worse, has become a motto of the more liberal reformist Muslims, okay. right? Okay. And he was saying that was, I think Ahmed Vanloli, if I'm not wrong, he's an imam and he gave this mosque in a sermon. And of course it was picked up by conservatives saying, yeah, yeah, this is the truth. He's saying, what this means is that there is no compulsion to religion, mm -hmm. one, but there is compulsion in religion. Mm -hmm. So he's actually, he's actually rewording the, <laughs> Meaning of the words. The word says there is no compulsion in the religion. Mm -hmm. He says no. It's just it means just two, and that is of course because the Quran is not the only source of Islamic law. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole body of hadith. Uh, these are sayings attributed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And as much as we respect Prophet Muhammad uh, himself, these hadiths uh, with overwhelming majority with one narrator, you know, right, narrating this what they heard or saw from the prophet and written, and it goes back in a few generations, you know, four or five people heard it from each other. And ultimately we have these narrations and they were canonized two centuries uh, after the prophet Muhammad. And it was a controversial issue in Islam. Another group called Ahl al -Rey, and especially in Iraq, the early Hanafis, Mutezala, they were skeptical about the authenticity of these narrations. Uh, and that's why the Hadith narrators and, and collectors don't like them. I mean, Abu Hanifa has been quite slammed by, for example, some of the Muhadditun. People generally don't know that because mm -hmm. Abu Hanifa was the founder of the Hanafi school, was thinking uh, there are a few hadiths that are trustable, limited number, and then Quran and Ray, that's human reason. As so his, his jurisprudence was based on that. Mm -hmm. But that's why he was actually, by, by for example, uh, Bukhari, uh, Imam Bukhari, you know, you, you see a lot of anger. Ultimately, this was settled and Hanafis came closer to the position that is defining the mainstream Islam. But the, the issue with the Hadiths is actually one of the key issues. Uh, there are some good, there's some good literature on this uh, that I also quoted in my book, because much of the uh, tension between Islam and human rights, as it is understood today, Things like apostasy laws, blasphemy laws, flogging people for, I don't know, drinking wine and all these detailed coercive measures, uh, a lot of negative attitudes about women. 
overwhelmingly they come from the hadith, from the hadith. therefore questioning the authenticity of the hadith or putting them in in, in, in context mm -hmm. is important <laughs> but that, that also requires some theological discussions about whether the prop everything the prophet did was religiously uh, binding or was he just living according to the time and norms of his age so that that text context discussion is also a part of this right. so in my books i try to put these things in an accessible way that uh, at least can make sense to the muslim who's curious about mm -hmm. these issues and i know some authorities will never change their minds on these and they will say you know we are the authorities and you're just a writer i, I yes. know that and i respect that but there's an endless discussion going on in, in the muslim community about right. all these right. areas of Right, yeah. right. Uh, just on this question of um, of of freedom and the use of la ikra fi to uh, to expand the discourse beyond simply apostasy laws, but also freedom within religion. So, like you alluded to, the um, the arguments of some that there can and should be certain amounts of compulsion for religious behavior. Um, so you mentioned, for example, like the market religious police, the hispa, how, how that can be connected. Um, but also, you know, there's the principle of al-amr bil maruf. Um, I promise we'll get we'll get back to the Quran uh, immediately or directly, everyone. But um, I, I read a, a scholar who made an, an argument that, well, the, the point of compulsion within religion, and I don't think he used the word compulsion. So, but the, he used maybe a more subtle term is that um, human nature is such that uh, it's hard to be self-disciplined basically. And so the, the function of religion is to keep you on the straight path. Once you make that sort of existential decision for religion, then the instruments or apparatus of that religion need to guide you um, by encouragement uh, and you know dawa and continual sort of um, preaching and um, uh, revivification of your faith, but also at times by coercive measures. And so he actually uses the example of uh, the story of Odysseus, uh, who had himself lashed or tied up to the mast when he was passing between uh, among the sirens, um, so that he, you know, he wouldn't be drawn away and cast into the sea by their siren song. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah, what, what would you say to that? I mean, what would be a sort of uh, liberal response to that? Well, I mean, of course, religion uh, requires some self-discipline, right? I mean, religion tells Muslims to fast in Ramadan for 30 days, and that is that requires some self-discipline, right? I mean, you're hungry, you're walking around, you see a nice burger, it's not iftar yet, so you don't eat it, and you need self-discipline to do that. But the question is, does that discipline, is it self-discipline <laughs> from within, which you should cultivate as an individual and as a community? I mean, you can choose to live in a community which is very conservative and you know reaching keeping things in, 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 in its terms of social life mm -hmm. in order and there's no problem with that and there's no tension with that with being a liberal political order but is it something that will be imposed onto you by government okay. or government employed groups and also groups that can take a vigilante uh, uh, duty to punish you for these things mm -hmm. and i think uh, the second answer i mean this using coercion is wrong for a few reasons first of all it's generally counterproductive i mean to to force people to be religious in the right way you define it i mean in this book i discuss you know women forced to wear the hijab in saudi arabia they fly yes. to turkey and they take it off right i mean right. so to to in iran Thank yeah you. in iran we see that i mean people uh one of the frequent tragedies in Iran is that people die out of drinking bootleg alcohol because I mean alcohol is legal but they want to make it at home and they so you don't you don't make people really religious you make them hypocritical you even turn you even create contempt against religion which is what John Locke actually was arguing he says contempt of his divine majesty is one of the results of this hmm. you know uh, course of, of a Christian commonwealth he says so that is one thing second when we accept this principle what is really being imposed on us as you know the good islamic way is the islam of who, whomever has power in a given territory interesting i mean in afghanistan now it's the taliban's <laughs> understanding of sunni islam and even other sunnis will say no i don't understand i mean taliban thought music is haram for example in the 90s 
uh, is music haram? Well, I don't think so. And many Sunnis don't think so. Some do because there are <laughs> different narrations about this. Haram, just just a haram banned, yeah. Forbidden. But my answer is forbidden. Yeah. yeah, I mean, religiously banned, not legally necessarily, religiously banned, like don't eat pork, right? I mean, so my answer is, if you think music is haram, good, never listen to it. I mean, it's your choice, right? But no, Taliban, when they think music is haram, and when their law is the law of the land, I mean, they were punishing people for having cassettes. I mean, uh, young people may not know what a cassette is today, but, you know, the music players, let's say, you know, yeah. the, the music players of the pre-modern, let's say, or pre-21st century era. Yes. Now, still, they're big, they're a little bit milder today. You know, they don't want to lose too much public face, but, you know, they still have those kind of rules. So I would say conservative communities, individuals have the rights to really have a disciplined life because that's what they think that's what their religion may require. And that's true for conservative Muslims, Orthodox Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews. I think for the Amish, you can totally create a community in which you know you will not have certain ways of life. I respect that. I'm not against that. Right. But the problem is, uh, the problem that we're criticizing is in many parts of the Muslim world today, from Saudi Arabia to uh, Afghanistan and and in countries like Pakistan, where you know it's it's quasi democratic, but you know there's Islamization of laws. The understanding of Islam by one group becomes the law of the land yes. imposed on all society, yes. Yes. and it has it's doing nothing good uh, because of the reasons I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I, there was a, a story I, that I, I thought of when you mentioned the music bit, where w when I was in graduate school, we wanted to get a gift for our doctoral advisor. It was his birthday, uh, and. Um, the people organizing this little project first wanted to get him a, a box set of CDs, so a little bit more modern than cassettes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, a box set of CDs, of some classical music that we knew he liked. And um, it was a mixed group of Muslims and non-Muslims. And, you know, there was one Muslim who was pretty conservative and said, no, no, I can't, I can't be part of this gift. Um, oh, okay. Because of so music. And then our next idea was a silk tie. And oh, there okay. are some traditions that silk, silk is haram for men, yeah. For men, yeah. No, 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 I can't do the silk tie either. So I think we ended up getting it's, a problem. It's haram. Silk is uh, haram when it is, I think, thicker than four fingers. Okay. So silk, silk tie, I, I, I used to measure that like in. <laughs> okay, okay. At the age of 16, like, is there a tie you can do this? Like a tie, is it four fingers or not? So yeah. Maybe that's just kind of if you quit. I, okay. Turkey, there was some discussion about that. Yeah. I mean, to me, these things are, I mean, they're all hadith based and I mean, probably the Prophet Muhammad, you know, told Muslims not to wear silk because it had a specific meaning there. Maybe it was luxury and the army needed some uh, contributions. And so right. these things, I see them mostly contextual. And there are things that are haram that are obviously haram and you understand why. It is haram to murder or steal or, uh, you know, attack people. So these are obviously universal things that are maruf, that's known. Yes. But all these other legal details, when you go into the uh, context and read the text, it is, it's just, you know, probably something about that particular context and culture. But right. people who were silk, you know, had a certain practice, maybe. Right, right. Well, let's turn directly to the Quran and maybe just with a, a, an open question. Um, you know, what are what are our, our viewers on this YouTube channel? Some are sort of deeply engaged in Quranic studies and like technical discussions, but others, you know, may, may not know much about um, the Quran, may not be Muslims, etc. So could we just start with, um, you know, a few things about the Quran that someone who doesn't know much um, should know? You know, what are a couple of things that you would sort of begin with in sharing things about the Quran? Mm -hmm. <sighs> One thing is that when you read the Quran, don't expect that you will learn a lot about the life of Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You will rather probably learn about Moses more than anybody else, uh, followed by Abraham or, or, or Jesus and Mary and, you know, other uh, biblical, uh, you know, uh, figures. And uh, that is because the Quran is not speaking about Prophet Muhammad, it is speaking to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... And that is, that creates one difficulty. And that is, the Quran is speaking to Prophet Muhammad during his prophetic mission. The Quran initiates the prophetic mission you know, with the Ikra, the first 
uh, worse. Sort of 96, yeah. 96, yes. Uh, and that's the word Quran comes from that, right? Iqra is Quran, recitation. Yeah, Iqra and means then, meant to read or to recite, yes. Yeah, and, and the Quran goes until, until the end of his prophetic mission. And we know from tradition that soon after the revelations ended, I mean, a few month, months later, the prophet passed away. So the Quran is speaking to his experience, but you don't see the experience itself. So, which is, which was, which, which makes our position different from the first Muslims who received Quran in their lived experience. Mm -hmm. Like the Quran is saying, those people with whom you made a treaty. Well, I didn't make a treaty with anybody. I mean, and I, I don't know exactly who, who those people are right. and what, they're, what, they, what, what was going on. The Quran is speaking, says to, to those people, or when the Quran is speaking to, about Jews and Christians, and that's something I think Muslims should know and others, it's not speaking about Catholics and Protestants and Orthodox Christians worldwide. It's speaking about the Christians in Hijaz, in 7th century Arabia at that time, and, and Jews. And this is quite clear. For example, it criticizes Jews for thinking Uzair is the son of God. Jews don't think like that today. Probably it was a very exceptional belief among some Jews at this is the just, time. Just to follow, this is Quran, I think 930, sort of Toba verse 30. Uzer usually understood to be Ezra, and as you Ezra, said, yeah. not the standard yeah. Jewish teaching that Ezra is Ibn Allah, son of God. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. And, uh, and so the Quran is speaking in this context, and I think what makes, and that's one difficulty sometimes in understanding what it is talking about. The other difficulty is it's just a matter of compilation. I mean, when the Quran was brought into a text, after the Prophet Muhammad, by the way, after his passing. And by the way, Muslims discuss should we bring it together into one text? He didn't do it, so is it bid'a to right. do it out? Right. And exactly. I ultimately agree that you can actually turn it into a text, like one book, a, a mushaf, uh, like pages all together. And when this was done, um, this was not done in a chronological way, as we all know. And after Fatiha, the longest surah goes from Bakara. So when you start reading the Quran right after Fatiha in the longest chapter of Bakara, you get into a discussion about some hypocrites and, and, and some behaviors of the Jewish, Jewish, Jewish tribes there. And you may not understand what is going on here, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, therefore, there are, there are different compilations of the Quran beginning with the uh, time of revelation. I mean, according to the, what do you call the process of revelation. Right, so, so you, starting you, with sort of 96 instead of- uh, Exactly. And actually reading it that way may be a, helpful. I mean, I, I, I have that sort of uh, compiled uh, Quranic uh, text as well. That might be actually a helpful way to understand what's going on there. So that's why I think the Esbab al-Nuzul tradition is important, the although it's imprecise. Of revelation. Yeah, yes. occasions of revelation is imprecise. Uh, it is not explaining everything to you, but it can give an idea. And that is especially when I myself realize as a student of the Quran, first just reading it, and, and when you read it without all this context, you also tend to take everything directed towards yourself. Uh, whereas the Quran is not directly talking to you, it's Absolutely. directly talking to the believers around Prophet Muhammad. So is everything that is told to them 100% relevant to you or not? This is a big discussion. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I think we need, you know, uh, some reasoned uh, deliberation here because you cannot take everything directly, you know, relevant to you. I mean, the Quran is speaking about forbidden months and you know, fighting the mushrikun when those forbidden months are over. Like nobody practices that today, right? Yeah. Or if they practice it, there will be some bad consequences. I mean, maybe extremists might be using that for some attack. So uh, I believe a, a historical understanding of the Quran, which Fazl Rahman emphasized a lot. Here's this thing, the Sunni tradition realize this historicity. That's why they developed Espab al Nuzul, uh, the occasions of revelation. However, they said, even if you understand, we, we need the context to understand it, still the commandments are eternally valid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the the specificity, specificity of the command doesn't rule out the universality of the commandment. Now, that's what the reformists movement, the historicist movement, beginning with Fazl Rahman and others, I think are challenging rightly in my view, because there are 
there are verses about slavery in the Quran. And, and uh, there are verses about emancipating, liberating the slaves, which gives us a moral imperative, which is very important. But there are a few other verses legislating the affairs of the slave, mm -hmm. slaves. Does this mean slavery is a constant <laughs> that, that we should think that in a Quranic environment there should be a slavery? That's not the view today, uh, thanks to a lot of changes in the past two centuries. But there are people who really think like that, actually. So and, you make and, a really strong case um, for the using that as a starting point for reflection on the need for contextualization, right? Because you say, you know, with like ISIS or, or Daesh accepted, basically the entire Ummah or Islamic community agrees that slavery is, is forbidden today. Um, but that involves uh, thinking contextually about the con about the context, yeah. but the situation in which the first community was and the situation we are in now and whether that those rules in the Quran should be applied now. And so if you do this for, for slavery, why not do it for other issues as well? Exactly, exactly. I mean, if you understand the Quranic legislation is contextual when it comes to slavery, uh, which is, you know, not everybody is actually even there, even in, in I mean, some, some very conservative people will tell you that while the Quranic legislation on slavery is eternally valid, just world conditions change this and their international treaties, mm -hmm. but maybe there will be slavery again one day and we'll be able to use these verses. So to think that everything written there must have a counterpart in the real life right. is I think is fundamentally a mistake in, in my view, but that's a very controversial uh, opinion. Well, you, make a, you certainly make a really convincing point in regard to the nature of the first or the second person singular and the second person plural uh, articulations in the Quran, right? Because, you know, the Quran says things like such as uh, a, a verse you speak about, um, So do not debate the people of the book except in the best way. And it's a command and it's a second person plural command. But then you also have verses like, um, uh, and fight against those who do not believe in God in the last day. That's also second person plural command. So yeah. uh, are you Which going was used as a way to abrogate verses of toleration? Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. So um, so that that articulation needs a lot of reflection. Yeah. Here's I think what what happened. I mean. Uh, I have another article, and actually it's part of my discussion too, like liberty was Islam's first call. And I wrote that a while ago. Like in, in Medin, in Mecca, Muslims are just a tiny minority, right? There's like right. 40 people right. in the beginning. Right. They proclaim Islam, they're persecuted. What they demand is, lekum dinikum right? And to, to, me, to, our, to me, my religion and to yours. So, and, uh, or prophet is not a compeller, he's just a warner to people. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't, they would really what they demand what we would call religious freedom today. Uh, I ask a question that Muslims typically didn't ask. What if the Meccans said, okay, right? What if the Meccans had allowed them to practice and preach Islam? The, I say the trajectory would be different, but the Meccans don't do that. They keep persecuting Muslims mm -hmm. and Muslims run away. I mean, they, they flee. It's like an exodus story, you know, uh, from Mecca to, to Medina. And when they go there, their, their properties are still plundered. That leads to raids, that leads to battles. And there's this endless war and fighting that goes on until the end. And uh, whether those words were defensive or not offensive, that's been discussed. I would say they were necessary for survival. Some were technically offensive, but once you establish a state, an armed state in an environment like that, you have to protect it. You have to sometimes strategically go and uh, preempt a, an attack on it. And, and there are verses coming in these situations. And for example, the verse that you recited in Surah al tawbah about fight them until they're subdued, until they pay the jizya with Ahl al kitab mm -hmm. uh, That comes in the midst of this Tebuk uh, expedition. I mean, Muslims are thinking that the Byzantines are attacking them, so they are, they're going there. And it's, I think, on the way from back from Tebuk that that, that verse comes. Now, what I think the tradition did as a mistake is that they realized that there's a progression here. And then they froze the progression at 632 AD. Mm -hmm. Then Prophet passed away. Mm -hmm. This was the last verse in Surah uh, Tawbah and the verses of the sword. So these outrule other ones. Whereas we could have easily said, 
well, that was a specific situation. And then life went on and the age of empires ended and you know, we live in a different world right now. We don't need these wars anymore. Mm-hmm. So those words do not abrogate them. They are all different parts of the scripture and should read scripture as a full, uh, fully valid, but we should understand which part is valid for our context today. And we live in a modern context of general peace. Uh, we, don't, we don't need that abrogation doctrine. And the thing is, Many people actually have said that in the past century. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is a growing acceptance of that, I think, in, in, in many, many circles. Mm-hmm. So I also am calling on Muslims to see that, well, let's accept that we wouldn't probably abolish slavery with our uh, epistemology if, if the modern world didn't. So sometimes accepting something that is coming from the outside, which is generally frowned upon, is not a bad thing, mm-hmm. such as modern ideas of human rights or, or, the, or liberal democracy. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, speaking as an outsider, uh, and it's not my job to do sort of theology for the sake of Muslims, but just, you know, re- reading your works, uh, I think a v- very coherent case can be made that Medina, so the period between 622 and 632, um, in a theological reading of Islam does not need to have priority over Mecca between 610 and 622. Um, I, yeah, I, I find it convincing uh, as an outsider. So I wanted to speak about, um, go back to this book, Reopening uh, Muslim Minds, and uh, speak about the case you make for using reason generally, which is, it's related to all of this, obviously, because the, uh, the, um, the move, the contextualizing move um, involves a certain um, recognition of the, um, the validity of, of reason. Uh, um, of course, even those who believe that revelation takes precedence over reason necessarily need to use reason. So there's a bit of a paradox there. But you, you do make the point in the book that um, the Quran seems to have a high um, estimation of, let's use the Arabic word, aql, so rationality or reason. Uh, you know, it speaks of those who do not, uh, who do not use their reason in a pejorative way. Uh, it encourages reason. And you note in the book, I think it's around pages 34, 35, that what the Quran condemns is uh, the use of, uh, of a hawa. So like, I think you define that as whim. Uh, and so that that's different from the condemnation of, of reason. So I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about that, but I, I also just, if I can add a little bit more to the question so you can put things together. I, I wanted to speak about something you engage here, which is the importance of um, recognizing a goodness and evil independent from divine command. Um, and you, you know, you, I think you use, you use the terms husn wa qubuh or hasan wa qabih. Uh, for uh, for goodness or good and evil, um, uh, so yeah, I mean maybe I'll just leave it there and let you take. Yeah, it. sure. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, when we say reason, some Muslims can say, "Well, everybody accepts reason." I mean, in Islam, it's accepted that if you don't have reason, you don't have religion, which means if you're an insane person, you know, you're not religiously obliged. So mm-hmm. everybody accepts that reason in the sense of understanding God's commands uh, is necessary, you know, and it's a part of religion and so on and so forth. But there was this interesting theological debate in the first few centuries on the authority of reason to figure out things are ethically right and wrong independently of revelation, which is the husn kubur. Uh, issue that you uh, and and I, I think it was important and I bring that up a lot. Uh, one group, the Mutazila, the first theologians of Islam actually uh, mm-hmm. that emerged in Iraq. Uh, they emerged in Iraq because Iraq was this cosmopolitan landscape, and they they faced all these different traditions: Nestorian Christians and right, Jews and right. Indian and Greek philosophy, and they wanted to rationally articulate Islam. That's why they were rational. It's not not that they were not pious people, they were. They were just Muslims in a a rationally diverse environment. And they argued, they had several arguments, but one of them was that they said, people know inherently what is right and wrong. And the Sharia indicates right and wrong, things are right. So they said, for example, if, 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 even if there is no revelation, if we find a person dying in the desert that is out of thirst and we have some water, 
we would know it is obligatory morally. It's obliged on us to help that person. Mm -hmm. Or they would say, even if there is no uh, revelation, we would know murdering an innocent person is kabih, that's ugly and that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So there is universal ethical values akin to natural law in the Catholic tradition. Mm -hmm. That is human by human nature that can be understood. But revelation is educating about them, reminding about them, specifying them, you know, and, and just we need revelation to further understand them. But even people without revelation, before revelation, could understand these values. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, I mean, a Greek uh, pagan guy named Aristotle might have some moral ideas that you can study or you can have a moral conversation with people from outside of your religious tradition as well. Um, but the other view, uh, staunchly defended by Asharites, the Ashari school, which became a dominant school in Sunni Islam, said they opted for divine commentary, which said things are right and wrong only because God said so. Uh, so murder is wrong because God said murder is wrong. And if God didn't say that, we wouldn't have any judgment on this. Therefore, before revelation, there was no value. Right? So I discuss this and I show that, I hope I show that, we need to reopen this debate because I think the Mutezala answer was the more correct one. At least it's modified version by the Maturidis, which also another part of the Sunni tradition. Uh, because uh, if you say there is no ethical value beyond the revelation, then you don't have any room to, you don't have much room to reinterpret the revelation. Mm -hmm. And when I say, you know, when the Quran says this, or we should understand, for example, the, the example I said about liberating slaves, right? I mean, the Quran speaks of liberating slaves, like emancipating them uh, or uh, freeing them, freeing a neck, it, it praises it. Mm -hmm. So from that, I infer an idea that freeing a person in bondage is a good thing. Then I go and tie it to the idea of abolition of slavery, which is a universal value. So I connect them. But if you're just looking into the text and you view no value beyond the text, you say, well, the Quran said that, but also it legislated slavery. So this is done deal. So where does this idea come from? So thinking in more universal terms, so being in conversation with values like universal human rights, uh, I think requires a, 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 an understanding of Islam that is based on not divine command theory, but ethical objectivism. Which, is the, which was the view of the Mutezala and partly the Matuidis. Whereas I think the Ashari insistence, uh, which was refined and it, was, it didn't remain, remain always simple. When you look at into Ghazali, you know, he's, he's toying with it. I mean, but, but still, Ashari's never gave up that whole insistence yeah. to date. And I show how this is coming up in the discussions about Makassid, the, the intentions of Sharia today, how this is coming up on uh, on discussions about whether we Muslims should engage with these ideas of liberal human values. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a sort of funny, funny remark, and maybe you'll tell me that it's ridiculous, but uh, I'm I, sure it's not. I, I sort of noted, uh, I mean, among uh, Muslim friends with whom I've spoken, but also just, you know, engaging with, um, with Islamic thought online, and uh, that there seems to be like the the title or label Matazali still has this very negative connotation. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of people actually think like the Matazila. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, just yeah. don't want to adopt the title. Does that yeah, make yeah. sense? Do you see that yeah, at it all? It does. It does. That is for two reasons. First of all, despite the vilification of the Mutazila by mainstream Sunni, especially Ashari Sunnis, some ideas of the Mutazila were later, you know, which some shyness was brought in. I mean, the whole idea of maslaha actually comes from Mutezila roots, the idea that God legislates according to human benefit. Yes. But the Mutezila said God is morally obliged to do that. And the Ashari says not obliged, but he can do it. And, you know, but still they brought in. So some Mutezila ideas were a little bit absorbed. Second thing is, but that was limited. Modern day Muslims just intuitively begin to think like the Mutezila. When they live in an environment, they see people can be moral without Islam. Mm -hmm. They see that, uh, you know, religion, I mean, they're living in an environment, they, they say, oh, Quran says this, and this points to this universal value. They kind of start to think like that, mm -hmm. but which, which requires a mutazila sort of reasoning. They might be implicitly getting, getting to it. 
But then they say, no, no, no. I mean, that's a kind of a uh, heretical view. Yes. And I want to, you know, uh, break these cliches a little bit. Why they were heretical? Because they were heretical because they were condemned heretical by the Qadri creed, which was the dictate of uh, Caliph Qadr, you know, in, in the 11th century for political reasons. I mean, this kind of, even Murgia, I mean, the, the term Murgia is frowned upon, but some of the Murgia ideas would be today universally accepted by Muslims. And, yes, interesting. Uh, so let's just break these cliches. And it was right. pointed out by some others too. I mean, saying that let's, let's look into the Islamic tradition as our tradition. So I, I look at it that way. I'm coming from a Sunni background, but I'm not saying I'm a Sunni and I will never read the Shia or, or, the, or the others and so on and so forth. I look at it as our tradition. Right. Uh, and wherever we can find wisdom in that tradition, we, we right. should cultivate, let alone wherever we can find wisdom outside, of course, in, in, in universal uh, culture of humanity. Well, I haven't done a very good uh, job managing time because, um, you know, we're sort of around the time where, where we should end. But I wanted to get at least one more one more question and, and then I'll, I'll beg you to come back. Um, so going back, going back to, to your most uh, recent book, um, I wanted to ask about an argument you make specifically about how to deal with, well, it, I mean, it involves with it involves reason and the, the recourse to reason, but it also, also has to do with how do you deal with opponents, religious opponents. And you build this argument in a couple of ways. I mean, you have a great anecdote there, for example, about uh, the, <laughs> excuse me, the Caliph Metmoon inviting a Christian theologian known as Theodore Abu Qura uh, into a debate and assuring him that, you know, he doesn't have to worry about a thing. He can speak freely and openly with no consequences. Um, so, and obviously in the backdrop of say blasphemy laws in Pakistan or other places too with the restrictions um, that, you know, is a really meaningful anecdote. But I wanted just to connect something to the Quran. I wanted to read a verse and connect it to your book. So this is Quran. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Surat Al-Imran, sort of three. I didn't write it down, but I'll double check three, 111. Uh, and they say, none will enter heaven unless he is a Jew or a Christian. These are their wishes. Say, say. So this is now the command. And in Arabic, it's qul. So it's second person singular. Produce your proof if you are truthful. And the Arabic there for produce your proof is uh, hatu burhanakum. Uh, so you, you point out this is not the only place you have this bit, produce your proof. Um, and it's sort of is sort of like the Quranic um, modeling of how to deal with opponents. So I just wanted to, yeah, ask you to to expand on that a little bit more. Sure, and um, I I use that discussion particularly to criticize Pakistan's blasphemy laws and the vigilantism that that done out of you know obsession of the obsession to punish blasphemy in Pakistan today. Even if people say something negative about Prophet Muhammad and even quotes that negative statement, that person gets, you know, attacked. Whereas I would say the Quran has negative statements about Prophet Muhammad that it quotes from the mushrikun, from the polytheists. And there is a response to them. Like, it's not like, how dare you say this? They say, you say this, and this is our response to you. Mm -hmm. So the Quran has this conversational right, right, right. style by the way, this this verse is I, I got it wrong. Not surprisingly, it's Surat Al Baqarah, so it's Baqarah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, sure. And uh, and they're not all in Mecca. People sometimes say it's a lot. There are a lot of verses in Medina as well. And because uh, it says, I mean, you will hear these hurting words from people given the book before you or, or from the polytheists. So I mean, these things will happen, and the Quran responds to these things with conversations, mm -hmm. which I think we can take as a mode. I mean, if there are people in the world today who say negative things about Islam. Uh, well, the, the, the Quran says, show your burhan, right? Well, they should be able to show their burhan, which is what's their evidence, which means they should be able to publish maybe their books about these things. So we respond to them, maybe we become, which is unfortunately not the mood in, let's say even Malaysia where books critical of Islam would be banned so that Malaysians will be confused, right? Whereas if you don't know what's the criticism of Islam, how do you ever build a more mature uh, uh, tradition? So I'm calling on Muslims to discover this more conversational, disputational style of the Quran to look into issues of freedom of speech today, where uh, instead of trying to ban ideas or narratives or words that are 
somehow uh, critical or offensive to Islam, we should learn how to sometimes answer to them, sometimes avoid them. The Quran also shows, you know, things like insult or mockery should be avoided, mm. not that punished. Mm. Uh, I mean, when you hear God's words is being mocked by a group of people, do not sit with them unless they engage in a different discourse. That's in Surah Nisa. It's actually repeated twice. That was in Nisa and in Maida. Uh, I think in Maida before. So um, the, there are these deems in the Quran that was overshadowed by blasphemy laws that was later established by a few hadiths. But when you look just purely in the Quran, there's no basis for blasphemy laws. There are no basis for apostasy laws. There are there are other uh, proclamations of what we would today see as freedom of religion or freedom of speech. And I, I try to highlight that in, in, in that in that discussion. Beautiful. Well, I think we should probably wrap up about now. Uh, thank you so much, Mustafa. It's really a pleasure to speak with you. And I hope I hope you can come back. Inshallah, let's say, Gabriel. It's God a pleasure. And, and let's do it again, inshallah. Okay. And thank you so much. It's been a pleasure as well. Thank you. Very best to you. Very best. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the, um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.